Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we will look at the first 12 verses of the second chapter of Matthew with a sermon about gifts for Jesus. To follow along with the life notes, go ahead and download them now from the web at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you today. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. And I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to uh, take one of the Bibles out of the chair in front of you. Use that. You'll find Matthew chapter 2 on page 960. And as always, if you don't have a Bible with you, we'd love it if you would take one of those um, If you don't own a Bible, take that home, call that our Christmas gift to you, because we want you to have the Word of God in your life and be reading it, not just on a digital device, but uh, in its physical form. Uh, And speaking of Christmas gifts, Christmas is coming up. We are just nine days, a little over a week away from that. So I've got two things for you. First, I I, I challenge you to grab some of these invite cards on your way out. They're at the lobbies, and I think uh, both wings as you leave. Uh, for two reasons. One, because we've got a little different worship schedule for everyone but you normal Saturday nighters. Uh, Grab one of these so you know what service to come to, but also let me encourage you to grab a couple extra and use those to invite someone. Say, hey, I'm going to, you know, this fill in the blank service time. Would love it if you would come with me. Here's the information. And, uh, you know, Christmas is one of those times where people are a little extra prone to accepting an invite to church. So, Use that to your advantage. Get a neighbor, coworker, family member here on Christmas. Uh, but the second thing uh, with Christmas is, of course, the gift giving. And uh, I was asked a few times, hey, have you uh, purchased your gifts, everything good? And I said, yep, my wife has done a great job getting things ready, and uh, I just show up. And, uh, but if you uh, are not in that position, you've got a week left, basically, so lean on that two-day shipping, lean on those local shops, because we focus so much of Christmas on gift giving. Uh, And so what we're going to do in this last regular weekend before Christmas is we're going to look a little bit of where did that come from? What's the, where's the background of this tradition of gift giving and what can we learn about that for our life today? But before we do that, I want us to kind of establish how well do we know the Christmas story? Now you might be like, I've heard the Christmas story a lot. Of course I know the Christmas story. So We're gonna do a little game because I was a youth pastor for about a decade and it's still in there a little bit. And this time of the year, I would always do a Christmas quiz with our youth group and it would be long and there'd be a cool gift card for the person that won. It's not gonna be either one of those, but we're gonna do a little quiz and it's still gonna be fun and I think still accomplish the same thing. So I want you to grab your bulletin, a piece of paper, open a note on your phone. It's gonna be a four question quiz. And if you're sitting with someone you know, play against them, the loser buys the meal after. If you're sitting next to someone you don't know, then play against them and the loser buys the meal after. And it can be a little Christmas gift to each other. But uh, we're gonna do four questions here. I encourage you to to play along and uh, I think it's gonna be fun. So I'll give you a second here. You got a couple of true false and a couple fill in the blanks. So first question, this is a true or false. Christmas was always celebrated on December 25th, true or false. And as I used to tell the students, you answer questions by writing with your hands, don't write with your mouth. You don't have to shout it out for everyone else. Uh, So write that down, true or false. Christmas was always celebrated on December 25th. Second question, this is a fill in the blank. How did Mary travel to Bethlehem? What method or mechanism did she use to travel from her home to Bethlehem? You can uh, write in your expected response there. Question number three, how many wise men visited Jesus? This should be a number between zero and say a million. Um, So somewhere in there should be roughly the answer. Or you uh, you could come up with a different answer if you'd like as well. How many wise men visited Jesus? Last question, question number four. This is a true or false. The wise men visited Jesus when he was in the manger. So visited him there, early life, true or false, visited him there in the manger in newborn, several day old form. All right, so looking at this, going through these, how many of you feel confident you aced this? You got four out of four. All right, so kind of take a look around. We got, I don't know, a third, 25%, 30 of you percent think that you ace this. So let's go through and see how you did. So question number one, uh, Christmas is always celebrated on December 25th. That is false. 
it was not always December 25th. Uh, for about 336 years, there was no official date of Christmas until the Emperor Constantine said, let's establish this date. Uh, without spending our entire sermon going into the history of that, there were other dates. The most notable other date was January 6th, which was celebrated in the, the more eastern regions of the world uh, due to calendar differences. And I like their January 6th holiday better than some of what we remember January 6th as now. But uh, Emperor Constantine established December 25th as the official date in AD 336. So, Official answer there is false. Uh, question number two, how did Mary travel to Bethlehem? So obviously if you had like, you know, car, truck, SUV, plane, bike, any of that, you're just go ahead and scratch that out. Uh, if you had something like a donkey or a camel or a horse or something like that, you can also cross that out because nowhere in scripture does it actually say how she got there. Just like in scripture, there's actually no innkeeper who says anything. That's, another, that's not part of the quiz. But um, the correct answer is actually blank. So if you were like, I'm not playing, I'm going to leave that one blank, you actually got one correct. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, we don't actually know how she traveled there. So we can't, as much as the illustrations and stories put her on this nice little gentle donkey traveling, that is not uh, biblical. Third question, how many wise men visited Jesus? How many of you, okay, I'm gonna pause here. How many of you wrote down three? All right, so you can go ahead and use that hand that you're raising with to go ahead and cross that out as incorrect. <laughs> See that? So they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but they did not actually say there was only three wise men who came. Uh, we're not given a number. Again, the correct answer is an unknown, a question mark, a blank answer. It is more than one, less than a million, somewhere in there, but three is not a definitive correct answer. Uh, the last one relates to those wise men, true or false. The wise men visited Jesus when he was in the manger. That is false. Uh, we will see in a minute when we read our passage, they visited him in a home. So if you've got this nice nativity scene that's got baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men there in that nativity, when you pack up that nativity, go ahead and leave the wise men out. They'll be ready next year and it'll be closer to factually accurate in 12 months when you set that back up. Um, and so, okay, so how many of you actually did ace that quiz? Okay, there's like five hands. So, hey... I, I share this uh, for the same reason I shared it with our, our, our student ministry back in the day, not to shame you and be like, ah, we know more than you, but to point out sometimes there's sections of scripture, there's stories in the Bible that we go, oh, I know this. I can just kind of check out and just go on cruise control. And maybe there's information in here that, that we have picked up erroneously. Maybe there's areas that we haven't actually learned exactly what scripture says the way we think we have. And I wanna challenge us to, to see with new eyes and listen with fresh ears tonight as we look at uh, this next portion of the Christmas story to see what we can learn from it as we look at the story of the wise men. So we'll take a look at that. Matthew chapter two, we're gonna start in verse one there of chapter two, page 960, if you're using one of the church Bibles. And Matthew says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it was written by the prophet, and they quote Micah here, it says, in you, O Bethlehem, and land of Judah, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse seven, when Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, a star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So here we see 
what essentially is the last passage in the, the Christmas story progression. Be, after this, we kind of get into more historical events that follow, but, but we see the story of the wise men here, this, this establishment of, of gift giving and this tradition that we follow. But I think there's some really rich things that we can learn from this, and, and I wanna unpack some stuff, but before we get there, let's, let's look at some observations from the wise men, some, some notable things here. And the first is, who are these guys? Because uh, we've already established that the number uh, of wise men, maybe we don't actually know the way we think we know them. Uh, and we think about these Christmas songs, like We Three Kings of Orient Are. And that title in line is only about one third accurate from what we see. because so we know it wasn't just three. They probably came in a large group. They were traveling hundreds of miles from the Orient. That is correct. They're probably from the East. They're coming hundreds of miles. They didn't just do that with three people. It would have been a large company. And they weren't actually kings. They weren't royalty, but these guys were scholars. These were, were noble men of, of education and scholar. They were likely astronomers or philosophers that used stars to guide their philosophies and things like that. And so they knew of, obviously, the, these prophecies related to this coming king and Messiah and the star that connected to it. And so they traveled. And so we, there's a little bit, we can unpack more, but a little bit of who they are. But we also, the thing we focused most on is the gifts that they bring. And, and, and again, we reference back, we give gifts because Jesus is a gift to us, because the, the wise men gave gifts to Jesus, and we carry that on 2,000 years later. But if we're honest, the gifts are a little odd, aren't they? Like, I'm, I'm gonna be a little transparent. I don't remember much of what we received for our, our baby shower gifts aside from like diapers and clothes. Um, but I do know that we did not receive any gold, frankincense, or myrrh for like, here, welcome, you now have a child, here's some gifts. Um, I would have remembered that and I'm sure you're in the same boat there. So we can look at that and go, that's very odd, isn't it? It seems completely impractical. And it's like, yeah, the guys picked out the gifts. If the woman, you know, would have picked, if they were wise women, they would have brought different gifts maybe. But I think there's a couple things that we can look at here with the gifts that, that show a lot of significance. And the first is that these would have been incredibly practical and useful for Jesus' family in the coming weeks and months. Because if you continue reading in Matthew, Herod gets enraged at, and continues this anger that there's a new king that threatens his dominion. And so he orders all baby boys under two years old in Bethlehem to be executed. He's like, let's just get rid of this supposed new king and kill them all. And so God warns the family to flee to Egypt to get out of there for the protection of Jesus. And so those gifts would have provided important monetary needs for their, their travel and, and sustaining their life in Egypt for a couple years until Herod died and they could move back home. So there's some, there is actually a good deal of practicality there, but there's also another side of this. There, there, there's some tradition that suggests that there's some significance to the selection of those three gifts. And, and when you look at Jesus' life, you see that he has three main roles in how he functions as a, as a leader and representative for God that connect to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God had three kind of offices of leadership for his country. He had prophets, priests, and kings. And the, the shorthand of this is the prophets were the one who came and proclaimed God's truth, brought judgment and blessings to them, and proclaimed you know, the things that God's people needed to hear. The priests were the people who, who handled the sacrifices in the temple, handled the spiritual and sometimes tangible needs, and the kings administrated and led and organized and ruled in that way. And Jesus, in his life, perfectly and completely functioned in all three of those roles, more than anyone else in the history of the Old Testament. He was a perfect fulfillment of those three offices or roles. And the gifts are thought to kind of get ready for that, because gold, is a gift fit for a king. And Jesus was born king of the Jews. Frankincense was a, a, a material that was used in the, the temple for uh, their fragrant offerings. The priests would use that to, to, to bring up fragrant offerings to God as part of the temple worship. And Jesus is presented as our great high priest. Uh, myrrh was a, a, a fragrance that was used in embalming, and, and there's an understanding that there's, there's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a prophetic gift that Jesus would give his life and need to be buried and, and have those burial spices used. And so, while not biblical, the tradition suggests and sees the correlation that, yeah, there's a, a tangible need for these gifts, but there's also some, some forecasting of what Jesus would do with his life here. And so, 
we look at this not to say, hey, these gifts are really great. Here's some ideas. If you're needing something for your sweetheart, get her some myrrh um, because the end is coming or anything like that. And we look at, okay, what does the travel and gifts of men 2,000 years ago matter to us when I can barely remember my travel plans? And if you're a dad, you don't know what you got your kids for Christmas either. Um, so what does this have to do for us? And, and to unpack the significance, I've got four questions that I want us to ponder. And no, these are, this is not another quiz. You don't have to judge your answers against your neighbor. But I've got, I've got four questions that I hope you ponder and think about and, and think about the significance of the wise men's actions for your life. And the first question is this, what will your response be to the news of Jesus? Because the, the, the wise men had a bold response. They, they f- saw the star, they understood its significance and they immediately responded. They began travel plans, they got their expensive gifts together, they began to, to, to make way towards this coming Messiah and King of the Jews. They responded. But if you notice in the story, they didn't go immediately to Bethlehem. It says that they traveled and went to Jerusalem. Now, it's not that this is far off, it's only about five miles in between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, so is that a navigational error? What is that? No, I think that was intentional. Because after all, Jerusalem is the capital city. It's where the temple was. It's where the governance was. It's where the the center hub for everything significant would happen. So for them, as they're preparing travel, they're like, well, if if here's the new king of the Jews, certainly they're gonna be talking about it in the capital city and that's where he's gonna be. If this is the Messiah, certainly there's gonna be a big hubbub in the temple and there's gonna be worship and celebration that God has fulfilled his prophecies. And so they go to Jerusalem and they find nothing. There's just business as usual. There's no celebration and and, and hailing of a new king. There's no worship in the temple of the Messiah that has fulfilled God's prophecies. There's just a normal day. And so they start asking, hey, what's going on? We, We traveled hundreds of miles to be here. Why isn't there more happening? And finally, word gets to Herod and notice that that there is not, you know, events happening for lack of knowledge. Because Herod gathers together the chief priests and the scribes, these experts, these leaders of the church, these experts in the Old Testament, these are the people with the most knowledge and they immediately start spouting off the prophecies and the information. They know exactly what God's plans were and how the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And yet there they sit with literally life and history changing events happening just five miles away and they sit there as if nothing's happening. And I think as we look at this, we see that the the response of these people shows us the response that is still happening for people to the news of Jesus today. You have some like Herod who who hear the the news of Jesus and they they hear the the name and the, the, the gospel of Jesus shared and they respond in anger and hatred and mockery. They say, I don't want anything to do with that. Get that away from me. You have some today that are like the chief priests and the scribes who know the information, but they respond to the the news of Jesus with apathy and indifference, and they just continue on their everyday life, seeking to make other man-made things as important as Jesus should be in their life. But you have some that hear the news of Jesus and respond like the wise men, and they drop everything, and they say, my life is now going to exist to go and seek and pursue and worship Jesus, even where there's great cost and inconvenience to me. And the truth is we can't control how other people respond to this news, but we can control how we respond to it. So let me ask you, how are you responding to the news of Jesus? Are you worshiping him? Are you, are you pursuing him? Are you making him the most important thing in your life? Because that's what we see modeled with the wise men. They say, hey, let's drop everything and immediately go and pursue Jesus. And the second question immediately follows that, is, and that is, are you seeking to worship Jesus with your life? not just with a, a portion of it, but with all of your life. Again, that's, that's what the wise men model here. They, they don't just pop into a church service because they're traveling by. They don't fit it into their schedule. No, they drop what they're doing and make this happen. They drop what they're doing and prepare expensive gifts and to bring to him. They, they interrupt their schedule to say, hey, let's take a long, probably multi-month, several hundred mile journey to another country to go and pursue Jesus. This action wasn't insignificant or casual on their part, but it's bold, it's, it's, it's all consuming with their life. And for us today, I think it's easy to see worship as just something that happens in a room at a church campus. 
or just say worship is a genre of music that we can listen to or play or sing along to. When biblically we understand that worship is something that's, that's consuming all of our life, that's giving all of who we are, all of our devotion and commitment and energy and passion and focus into God himself. When you look at the Old Testament early on, God says, hey, to worship me means to, to love me with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength, all of you being poured out in your worship and pursuit of God. But again, it's easy now to take that idea of worship and say, well, it's one seventh of what I do because it's what happens on a Saturday or Sunday or it's what happens when I attend church. So let me ask, are you worshiping Jesus with your life, with all of your life? And does your life look like you are following and serving the Son of God and Savior of the world? with your marriage, with your parenting, how you run your business, how you interact on social media, how you handle your finances and your conversations and your thought life. Do those categories look like you're worshiping and serving Jesus or do they look like you're worshiping and serving yourself and your motives? See, I believe that God desires for us to be fully committed, fully devoted to, to following and worshiping him. And when we make that choice, when we sacrifice to do that, he blesses and transforms and helps us in radical ways. But so often we want those blessings, we want that transformation, we want that help with only giving partial devotion and attention to him. And that equation doesn't pencil out. So are you seeking to worship Jesus with your life? Because the, the wise men showed us that devotion, that commitment to say, hey, we are all in of pursuing him. But also, what they did in the process brings us to the next question, and that is, what are you offering to Jesus? See, they brought gifts to him, gifts that were not insignificant, and were not given the exact amount of how much gold and frankincense and myrrh that they brought, but these were expensive, rare materials, just like they still are today. And so there's estimates that say this could be anywhere from you know, $100,000 upwards up to seven figures possibly by today's standards. This was not insignificant to them. And they didn't do it to try and bribe Jesus and be like, hey, if we give him these really cool gifts, he'll let us into heaven. Because scripture in Deuteronomy says that God is not bribed. He didn't, they didn't see you know, what was coming and they have some you know, special knowledge that they, they would need some, some liquid assets to flee because God is going to provide for his son and, and for us however he needs. But instead they said, hey, what do we have? What is, what is in our life and how can we worship him with that? How can we give sacrificially from what we have? How can we give to show that, that Jesus is a greater treasure than the most expensive materials we can get our hands on? How can we say, Jesus, you were significant and I want my actions to reflect that? So just like the wise men gave gifts, let me ask you, what are you offering to Jesus? What are you offering from your worship, from your time, from your obedience, your, your abilities to serve with your time and your talents? What are you offering to Jesus uh, as your money, as an offering, as, as your love for others? And, and do those gifts have value? So you think it's easy to go, well, I'm doing things for God. But when you really stop to look at it, are you giving at a point of, of significance and value from those categories? See, we say we love God and we'll give him our time, and yet the truth is we may only touch the Bible and spend time with him once a week or so. See, I read a study a couple weeks ago that 45% that of Bible-believing Christians in America read their Bible only once a week. If you really get down and say, hey, how many of them read their Bible every day? And it doesn't say they've done this full quiet time and they've journaling and memorized. No, they just open their Bible and reflect on God's word. Only 10% of Christians in America read God's word daily. And yet we say, we love God. We'll give you all of our time about once a week. See, we say we love God and, and we're, we're willing to, to, to spend time with him, but we only pray when we need something from him. We say we love God, but we don't prioritize using the gifts he's given us to serve and bless the people around us that he's given us opportunity to do that with. We say we love God and we trust him, but we give out of our leftovers instead of tithing off the top of 10% like he called us to. We say we love God, but we're selectively obedient and we seek to justify or navigate the areas of our life that are uncomfortable against scripture. 
So are we offering gifts of value? Are we saying, hey, Jesus, I am giving all of what I have to you, or are we just giving him a little portion? Because Jesus knows what we have to offer. He knows when we're going cheap with our gift to him. And I'm not talking about the dollar amount. I'm talking about how much time are we giving? How much attention and, and focus and worship are we offering to our Savior? What are you offering to Jesus, and does that have value? And the final question that I think this story brings to us is a question of, will you let Jesus change the direction of your life? See, we didn't really touch on this, but the wise men, they have this, this interaction with the king, and we kind of saw that where they're in Jerusalem at first, and Herod says, hey, yeah, le let me know where you find this Savior, because I want to worship him, um, and that, I'm telling the full truth. And, and later, they're told in a dream, hey, no, he wants to come kill Jesus, so you need to go home a different way. See, their, their trip home after worshiping and spending time with Jesus took a different direction than what they were planning. And at risk of over-spiritualizing this, I can't help but notice that after they spent time with Jesus and worshiped him and came face to face with the Savior of the world, their life took a different direction than what they had planned. And I wonder if for us here today, if we're willing for the same thing to happen to us, if we're willing to let Jesus change the direction that our life is heading. Because as you look at the Christmas story, that is one of the overarching themes. Last week we looked at Mary and Joseph and how their life took a radically different direction than anything they had planned for their family and their marriage and their life. The wise men were not planning this, this multi-hundred mile trip to different countries to worship this baby, and yet they let God interrupt their plans both on the way there and on the way back. The shepherds, the night of Jesus' birth, were planning on just watching their sheep and probably nodding off and enjoying a good night's rest when the angels came and interrupted with news of the coming Messiah. All these people let God change the direction and plans and path of their life. Are you willing to do that? Or are you trying to, to write the plan for your life in ink and say, this is exactly what I want to happen. This is the outcome that I want to see take place. So I don't think we'd actually say these words, but I wonder how many of us would love a chance to give God some advice on how to lead and direct our life and just, just slip in a good word here and there. And yet Isaiah 55 reminds us that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways better than our ways. We can't pretend to be in the place of God in terms of wisdom and knowledge. So are you willing to trust God and allow him to change the direction of your life? Maybe there's an area of obedience that you are feeling led to step into. And it's gonna be costly. It's going to be uh, something that requires sacrifice and life change. But you say, okay, Jesus, I'm gonna trust you in this place. Maybe there's somewhere where he's inviting you to change your priorities and say, hey, I've been seeking to serve myself or do something in this way, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna prioritize following you. Maybe there's an, an area of your life that, that he's calling you to, to live with uncomfortable grace and forgive someone who's hurt you or hurt someone around you. Maybe he's calling you today to, to assess the purpose and priority of your life and move it from seeking success in a worldly sense to seeking to glorify and worship him with your life. I don't know what area of your life he may be calling you to change direction in, but I know that in my life, every single time he has challenged my direction and changed my direction, it's worked out better than anything I had planned. It doesn't mean that it's easier, but it means that it was better and it blessed my life of walking and following him. And so are you going to allow him to change direction? Because we look at the Christmas story, I see much more than the wise men just establishing a tradition of gift giving, but I see them modeling faithful service to Jesus, worship that, that is significant and meaningful. And, and probably an event that causes us to question how we're responding to and worshiping Jesus, how we're responding to his prompting and leadership in our life. And I pray that in the next week as you get ready for Christmas, as you reflect on the story of Christmas, you wouldn't just seek to give good gifts, that you would seek to worship Jesus and live your life as a gift pouring out to your Savior in every way. Because that's what this part of the Christmas story is all about. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to a world that was broken and sinful, a world full of people who are apathetic and angry at the news 
And God, we wanna be people who are excited and joyful and, and pursue the good news of your son Jesus in our life. God, help us to be people who, who examine our life on a regular basis and don't get to a place of complacency and, and comfort in our faith, but are continually asking, God, how can I give you more of who I am? Because you deserve it, you are worthy of it. You're worthy of the greatest gifts we can give because of what you have offered us, and that is salvation in your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for the hope and the promise of eternity that he brings, and we pray that we would respond accordingly that we would respond with excitement, with joy, with curiosity, with devotion and commitment to you so that we can be people who worship you with our life, who don't just give gifts of tangible things, but give our life as a continued offering pouring out for you because God, that is what you deserve. We thank you and we praise you. Help us to continue to worship tonight in Jesus' name, amen. The wise men traveled by following a star to Bethlehem to see Jesus and give him gifts. They had gold, frankincense, and myrrh to offer to the newborn king. What are you offering to Jesus? Will you let Jesus change the direction of your life and follow him where he leads? In an effort to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, we post daily three to five minute devotional videos on our Facebook and YouTube accounts. You can sign up to receive them by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Devo. That's D-E-V-O. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a terrific week, and we'll be back next weekend. Bye-bye.